the black is cleaned up as good as I'm going to get it. I don't know if you can see it there, but 030, 30 over, all these dots I believe point towards the front of the block. And the heads are cleaned up as good as I'm going to get them. I wish they were a little flatter and I wish the surface was a little bit better, but they're getting screwed back on the way they are. I was researching these head bolt holes, trying to figure out if they're all blind holes or what. Looking at them with a flashlight, you can tell that it looks like they're all blind. You probably can't see, but this one here had a lot of rust in it. I have a precision ground straight edge here. I think it's within one ten thousandths or something crazy accurate like that. And just out of curiosity, You can check this thing every which way to Sunday. The block's actually looking fairly straight. The head actually, uh, I can slip around a four thousandths in between there, but it is what it is. We're going to run it. Hopefully the gasket seals well. Here's the old gasket, and I noticed uh, there's an opening here. And at first I thought, hey, this gasket's missing that. But then looking at the other one, it's not there. And I closer look, looks like it actually eat through. So it's kind of curious, I started studying the block, it looks like the water pump pushes in the uh, coolant right here, it goes through all these water jackets around the cylinders, then it uh, comes up through all these holes here, up through the head, so now we're in the head, and then it ultimately exits here into this hole, into your thermostat housing area. This here would be returned from the heater core. If I lay it on there, you see that that hole's missing, but it's present in the back. These are labeled front. I think what's happening here is they don't want that coolant immediately circulating back through. Maybe they want to try to mix it up some more. I don't know. That's my best guess. Some of these head bolt holes had rust in them. They've all been chased out, but it's probably like four or five of them. I was reading some postings in a blog, and it was saying that some of the early 351s had an issue with the water jackets cracking when the head bolts were torqued down. I looked at them with a flashlight as best I could. I didn't really see anything jumping out at me, but I think I'm going to throw them all in with this ARP thread sealer. And I called ARP, I asked them what the difference in the torque spec was, and according to them, there isn't any difference. I had a head fall off an engine once. That wasn't fun. A couple of the heads on the uh, original head bolts were rusted really bad, so I just opted to change them all out. This one, for instance, is rusted and eaten away pretty bad. So I'm just going to toss some ARP bolts in this. Probably better than this engine deserves, but that's what was at hand. So these bolts come with washers. One end has a chamfer, and that obviously is going to go towards the radius end of the bolt. And I'm reading the instructions and it's saying to use the ARP Ultra Torque when it's a blind hole and then thread sealer when it goes into a water jacket. I wonder how you would get equal torque if you're using two different types of assembly lubricants. I'll use this on all the heads of the bolts and around all the washers. I'm going to set all these washers up with this Ultra Torque right away. A liberal coating in this thread sealer for all the threads. Alright, we're going to step torque it in three steps to 100 foot pounds. We just work from the center out. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And since these motors had problems with that cracking, I think I'm going to step torque, say this had all to 33, this is all to 33, and a 66, 66, and then 100, 100. Put this timing chain on now. There's a machine surface on the side. Looks about the same as the old one. And that's going to ride against that thrust plate. And I'm going to guess that this cavity fills up with oil and it comes out these notches. This is supposed to lubricate in between there. And also completely lubricate the chain. There's only one notch on the bottom gear. 
get the dot up. So there's a non-adjustable timing chain, but that's fine for this engine. I think I'm going to put a little ultra slick assembly lube in the back of this gear. See the oil comes out of this notch here and it's apparently it's supposed to lubricate the rest of the chain. It fought us a little bit going on, but you can see it's got a little play. It's possible this block was a line board moving the crank closer to the center line of the block, but this is going to be good enough for us. This is at eccentric for the fuel pump, and I think I'm going to put some assembly lube in here. It seems that this kind of floats around in there. this washer on here the correct direction. So it's saying our Campbell takes the thread locker here, 40 foot pounds. I guess we'll throw some on there. This is a high strength stuff. So. Put some of this on here and I'm gonna get a bunch of this chain. Check out how sticky this stuff is. If you notice, there's different retainers on it too. I don't think any of these retainers are the correct ones for these springs. Here's one of our lifters. I blew it out and all that fuel oil mix came out of it. And there is a wear on this. I believe there's supposed to be a little dome on there to help these rotate. But this is what we're going to run. We're going to put them all back in the same positions we took them out of. I'm not going to worry about plunging on it or anything because we're going to be priming this engine and rolling it over until we get Good oil flow out of all the push rods. This is lifter number two. We're cleaning out these push rods, blowing air through them, looking through the hole, making sure it's clear. And we're just rolling them to make sure it's straight. Well, when this engine was sitting at the farm, I was told that one of the push rods fell into the engine. It was fished out and put back in there, so it ran. But check this out. Look, you can't even push a stack of push rods together because several of them are bent so bad. I mean, look at the spacing here. So, how many do you guys see that are bent? Three of them pretty bad, is what I see. We've got a new shop tool here. 12 inch style caliper. It's not a Sterad, it's an off brand, but it's I think about a fifth or sixth the cost of a Sterad. But I needed this to measure these push rods to see what we had. The only way that happens is if something makes contact and stops motion. Okay? So when you got a work truck, Here's that one that's good. and it doesn't make enough power to really rev, you know, doing a smoky burnout. Usually it's in mud. Somebody gets stuck and then they get pissed and they s gas the throttle and they're revving the engine. The cam can't follow, or the lifters can't follow the cam because the springs are too weak. It gets out of, you know, sink and it's bouncing off the lobes of the cam and the valve hits the piston and something's got to move because how else would these bend? Something stopped it from motion. So it's 9.5, yeah, 9.5. You know, if I squeeze this tighter. It's a nine and a half inch yeah. long push rod, which is actually kind of long. 9.505. Yeah, obviously it's a lot looser. So now we're down to 9.480 times, I think the ratio is 1.7 on that rocker arm. 42.5 thousandths lift is what you'd be losing, so like a 20th of an inch. <laughs> 